If you have your Bibles, let's get into the Word. Let's get into the Word. We're in the Gospel according to Luke. Oh, I'm so excited, so excited about the message today. The Gospel according to Luke, starting with verse 31, Luke chapter 22, starting with verse 31. When you have it, say amen. If you're looking at the screen and don't want to get into your Bible, just want to look at the screen, you can say amen. Word of God says in verse 31, Simon, Simon. He's not calling him Peter. He's not calling him Petros. He's calling him by his original name. This is important. This is important. This will tie in to next week's message as well. So just put a pin there. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, not Simon, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me. Deny three times that you know me. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for trusting us in this space, this sacred space as we open our hearts to you. Oh God, you are a God. And right now that is what we need to examine our hearts as we continue this journey of being challenged to how we should follow you. So Father, accomplish your will in our lives this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen and amen. Amen and an amen. And this is why you fail. Anybody know where that line comes from? And that is why you fail? That is why you fail. Anybody know? Anybody willing to guess where that comes from? It's from a movie. I normally don't like quoting from movies, but, but when I was putting this message together, I couldn't help but quote, from the prophet Yoda. (laughs) It was the film, The Empire Strikes Back, that was released in 1981. It was the sequel to the blockbuster Star Wars. And they had introduced this Jedi master, Yoda. And you remember this, those of you who know, I know Marina, you said you you fell asleep watching Star Wars, so this may not, you may not remember this part. But, but, but Luke Skywalker goes to the planet Dagobah, and we loved this as children watching this film. And, and he's looking for this great Jedi master, but he, he, he happens to come across this little green character, so tiny. And he had broken speech, and he talked really funny. And, and Luke was getting frustrated because he just wanted to get along, get, get on with his day and find this Jedi Master and be trained. And finally Yoda reveals who he is. He is the Jedi Master. And Luke begins his training there on Dagobah. And Yoda is just dropping all kinds of pearls of wisdom. And during their training, something happens to Luke Skywalker's fighter his land speeder, it it begins to sink in the quicksand. And and so he runs to try to do something, but he can't do anything. He's not powerful enough. He's not strong enough. And Yoda encourages him, you can do this. You can lift it out of the swamp, just like you were lifting rocks. And Luke says, no, it's too big. He says, no, judge me by my size. And so he challenges him. And Luke does the force thing. You guys know this. We used to do this as kids all the time. If you just focus hard enough, you may be able to move something. Luke reached out his hand and the land speeder began to move. Yoda's eyes widen as he can't believe this young man is already at this place where he has so much command of the force. And for some of you who are feeling uncomfortable, just know that George Lucas, the creator of Star Wars, read a lot of the Bible and that's where some of his inspiration came from. So it's kind of biblical. (laughs) And so 
the land speeder begins to move and raises up a little bit, but Luke is starting to lose concentration. It feels too big, and then it sinks back into the swamp. And then he goes back to Yoda and says, I can't do it. It's tough, too tough. You want the impossible, he says. And so then Yoda reaches out his hand, and of course, the one of the best theme songs is Yoda's theme song, John Williams. Oh. And the land speeder begins to rise up from the swamp. And he brings it to a resting place on dry land. And Luke Skywalker goes up to Yoda and says, I don't believe it. And Yoda's famous words, that is why you fail. I should probably try to say it like him. Should I? <laughs> that is why you fail. <laughs> That's pretty good. That was pretty good. <laughs> that is why you fail. You don't believe. That is why you fail. Last week we talked about Jesus' proclamation that he is the rock and that he would build, he would build his church upon the rock. Jesus is the rock of ages. He is the cornerstone. He is the rock that is spoken of in Daniel chapter 2 that, that smashes that statue of Nebuchadnezzar that represents all the nations. Jesus is the foundation. Remember, he would never build his foundation upon a human being. For sure, not Petros, not a pebble but a sure foundation, a rock. Jesus is the foundation. And we were already read, even in 1 Peter, Peter acknowledges that Jesus is the rock and he is the foundation. But he said, I'll give you the keys, Peter. I'll give you the keys and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And Peter's feeling pretty good about himself. You remember this. And then Jesus then begins to share with them that he's going to suffer many things and that he would be crucified, but he would rise again in three days and Peter confronts him. The one who was just given the keys to the kingdom confronts Jesus and says, stop talking like this. Knock it off, Jesus. This is depressing talk. You're the Messiah, the Son of God. How can you say these things? And then Jesus turns to Peter and says, adversary, Satan, get behind me. And last week we talked about how quickly a saint can become Satan. A follower, a devout follower of Christ can be demonized just by their attempt to be a stumbling block for Jesus. That we had to be very careful. And it's very interesting that after this experience in Matthew 16, Peter seems to just spiral out of control there's more moments where he's putting his sandal in his mouth, more moments where he's, he's leaping before he, he, he looks, more situations. In chapter, in, 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 uh, in chapter 17, we're, we're given, in Matthew 17, right after chapter 16, we're given this account where Peter is struggling. I like Luke's account better. In Luke chapter 9, you have your Bibles in Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, it says, starting with verse 28, about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. Now remember, this is after Jesus had, had uh, 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 shared with them that if you want to come after me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. It is after this that he takes the three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, and they go up to a mountain to pray. What do they do, family? They pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure. Think about this. Imagine this scene here, Elijah and, and Moses talking to Christ about his departure, talking about the passion experience that was about to come upon Christ and, and about his resurrection and his ascension which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy. But when they became full, but when, when they became fully awake, they saw 
his glory and the two men standing with him, as the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, can I just ask a question? How did Peter even know who Moses and Elijah were? It's not like he had ever met them before. Do you think they had like lunch pails with Elijah's picture and a Moses thermos inside? I mean, how did he know? Maybe it was similar to the flesh and blood did not reveal this to him in chapter 16 in Matthew. Maybe the Holy Spirit let him know who these, these characters were. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And here comes one of my favorite funny verses in Scripture. Luke says he did not know what he was saying. <laughs> Matthew and Mark also speak about this because he was terrified. He just blurted out something. I love this text. He's waking up out of a sleep. You know how it is. You wake out of a stupor. He's waking out of his sleep. He sees all this glory. He sees, you know, Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus, and then they depart. And here's Peter, hey, Jesus, wait, wait, before they go, let's build three apartments up here. Now, I told you last week there's no bad ideas. This is a bad idea. He didn't know what he was talking about. What was Peter trying to get at? They were going to just hang out on the mountain for here on out that Jesus wouldn't finish his mission? Why would he say something like that? He did not know what he was saying. Can I say something? I think there's a lot of followers of Jesus that do not know what they're saying. And they just talk. They just talk. They want to sound smart. They want to sound like they've, they're read up. They want to sound like they're spiritual. And they just start talking. One of the most frustrating Bible studies to be a part of is Bible studies where there's a bunch of, like, learned believers. I was a part of a Bible study uh, a, a while back, and I asked questions because I was leading out in the study, and all the people that knew the Bible well gave the worst answers. So why do you think Jesus made this decision? Well, Pastor, I, I believe that what Christ was wanting to impart to his disciples and to us today is that he wants to imbue us with his righteousness so that we are able to channel a blessing that unlocks the secrets of the kingdom. And you can only come to this place as you open your heart to him and die to self, and then the blood of Christ will cleanse you of all unrighteousness and stop it. We just talking. No wonder non-believers don't want to come near us. We don't make sense. And especially when we want to quote Paul, one of my favorite verses, and we read from the King James, and we don't even understand what we're reading. But it sounds good. It's nostalgic. Why is this so important? Why is this so important? I'm going to tell you why. Most of us talk not knowing what we're saying instead of listening, hearing what Jesus is saying. Peter throws out something that makes no sense. Hey, Jesus, we're just going to build two shelters. We're going to put a little tent here, a tent there, a tent over here, and we're just, so Moses and Elijah can live here forever with you. And the Bible tells us that a voice comes from heaven. A voice comes from heaven in verse 35 from the cloud saying, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. What did the voice from heaven say? Listen to him. It did not say, keep talking. Listen to him. Too many times we are doing all the talking, trying to sound smart, trying to sound like we know it all, trying to sound like we have this deep, you know, close relationship with Jesus, always trying to be so esoteric, so obtruse, just just 
all the time where we, we create these walls between God and people. My son, I've told you, he, he's not a very big fan of church. And we have to figure out how children his age can enjoy church the way that we enjoy church. It needs to be simple enough. I loved being able to have a Bible study last night with the Chase family, their daughter wanting to be baptized. She's such a beautiful girl, very good thinker. And as we're going through the study, I keep saying to myself, wow, I sound like I'm trying to explain this to an eight-year-old. And I started to think I didn't sound smart. And the Holy Spirit said, you've never been smarter. I'm like, I'm just using children words here. I mean, I want to really break this down. And the Holy Spirit said, you never sound smarter. One thing that Auntie Ellen said in the book, in the book, The Desire of Ages, she said when Jesus would teach that even children could understand him. And you know that's true. You know that's biblical because children wanted to be around Jesus. And children don't want to be around anyone they can't understand. So however Jesus taught, it was, it was in such an inviting way. It was so inclusive that even children were up there on his lap saying, tell us again. So many failures, and here is Peter just speaking without knowing what he's saying. And this happened so often in Peter's journey. He's always speaking up. He's always speaking up. Of course, in chapter 16 of Matthew, he finally gets it right because God had revealed to him that Christ was the Son of God. But so often Peter gets it wrong. He's speaking instead of listening. Now this message is about failure and and I shared in our newsletter as a preview that we want to find three fail-safes when it comes to following Jesus. And you know what a fail-safe is, right? It's a, it's a device or a mechanism uh, or a plan that's in place that, that if something should fail, if something should fail in the machinery, if something should fail in the plan, having a fail-safe there would, would prevent it from being disastrous or harmful. So you want, you want big machinery to have fail-safes just so no one can be in danger if one component does not work properly. Fail-safes save lives. And I believe that there are fail-safes in our, in, our, in our walk following after Jesus. And the first fail-safe, the first fail-safe, I like to say it's the number one fail-safe, and we're going to highlight it again next week, and that is stop talking and listen. Listen more than you talk. Even when we come to pray, often our prayers involve too many words. We need to have one of our prayers where we're just silent in the sanctuary and we just listen to God. Can we just schedule that, Pastor Ivar's, next week? We should do that. Invite someone to lead us out in prayer and they say nothing. And we just listen. Oh, but Pastor, if we do that, we're not going to know what those thoughts are. Our thoughts or God's thoughts or the devil's thoughts? How are we going to know? Listen. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. Listen. Fail safe number one. Be a good listener. Let's continue on. In Matthew chapter 17, Again, both these stories happen right after Matthew 16, so I think it's critical. Matthew chapter 17, starting with verse 25. This is, this is after Jesus and his disciples had come into town, and the leaders of the temple saw that Jesus did not pay a temple tax, and they thought that was, that was a, a, a disrespectful. So they went up to Peter, and they said, we noticed that your master doesn't pay a temple tax. Is that how you roll? You don't pay tithe? You don't pay offering? You don't want to be a part of the giving challenge? You don't want to see our restrooms repaired? I'm just giving them a guilt trip. And Peter's like, wait a second, wait a second. My master pays temple tax. Everywhere we've gone, we've paid the temple tax. Just an oversight. Don't worry, I'll be right back. I'm going to get the money. In verse 25 says, yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? Ooh, he, switch, he switched it back to Simon. Again, this is a preview for next week. He switches it back to Simon. There's a reason why he calls him Simon here. What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? from their own children or from others? From others. 
Peter replied. I always have the right answer. Then the children, Jesus says, are exempt. Do you see what happened here? Jesus is saying to Peter, I don't have to pay the temple tax because I am the son. The children are exempt. Now, why was Jesus being so bold now before Christ would pay the temple tax? That's why Simon Peter was like, yo, we pay temple tax. We always be paying offering. We always contributing to the local church budget. But by this time, Jesus is in the final stretch of his ministry. And so he is, he, he is in dialogue and, and teaching people that, 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 that before he was hush-hush about. He's teaching people that he's the Messiah. He's teaching people that he's the Son of God. He's now willing to heal openly. He's now willing to raise people from the dead openly. Remember when he healed Jairus' daughter, brought her back from the dead? He went into a room, closed the door behind him and said, she's just sleeping, we're all good, she's just sleeping. But now, the final stretch of his ministry, Jesus is flexing now. He's like, yeah, yeah, who you say I am, that's me, that's me. He's now walking into the temple saying, no, 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 this is my father's house, this is my house. This is the stretch where Jesus is knocking over tables, flexing on people. Divinity flashing through the garbs of humanity. Christ now is not afraid of letting people know. Now what's interesting is that Peter is operating how Christ operated in the past. He's like, it was good enough back then, so why is it not good enough now? But here's the problem, family. Many of us, when we're following Christ, we start thinking we know where we're going. Jesus is moving in this direction. We go, you know what, Lord, I think I know where you're going. I got it. No, I got, I'm good. Just stay here. I know what direction you're going. I got this down, Lord. I know what to do. Have you seen yourself before running in front of Christ? Not waiting? Not being patient? Peter should not have answered for Jesus. He should have allowed Jesus to answer because there was a lesson to be taught to all of the haters that were around him. And they knew the chatter. He's claiming to be the son of God. <laughs> Watch this. <laughs> Once we press him to pay, he'll prove he's just an ordinary Jew. Family, do not run ahead of Christ if you're following him. Do not run ahead of the leader if you're following it doesn't matter how well you've done it in the past. It doesn't matter if that's the way we did it 10 years ago. Christ at times will switch it up because we're in a different generation. We're in a different place. There is different methods now. And so don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. No, you're thinking I'm making stuff up. Remember when Moses was asked to speak to the rock and he hit it? How many times he hit it? He hit it twice. Now, why did Moses hit the rock? That's right, Schubert. He did it before. That's how he got water out of the rock the last time. He hit it. So when Christ said, speak to it, he's like, Phew. where's my bat? <laughs> it was good enough for Moses. That's me. It's good. This is how it worked last time. Give me that old time religion. I'm going to do it the exact same way I did it last time. I'm angry, and I'm going to let these people know about themselves. Give me my bat. And he hits it once, and water doesn't come out. And instead of going back to the drawing board and saying, Lord, you did tell me to speak to it. My bad. Let me speak to it. No, he hits it again. And God is like, boy, if you don't get your... Now, God allowed water to come out because people were thirsty. But he said, Moses, get in the tent. Get in the tent right now. What are you doing? <laughs> Those people are getting on my nerves. Moses, you're done. What do you mean? You're done. Give me your license. Wait, no, 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 no. Give me your license. You're not going into the promised land. Why are you running ahead of me? Listen. Follow me. And that will be learned last week. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow this is what we do, but watch Jesus. Now, Peter makes the mistake. He misrepresents Jesus by running ahead of him. He misrepresents Jesus as a simple, common, common rabbi, not the son of God, not the Messiah. So Jesus tells him, 
All right, bro, so we don't offend. <laughs> this is the only miracle that Christ performs in the Bible for the reason of not offending. This is not to heal anybody. This is not to save anybody. Jesus just performs this miracle to make a point. So we don't offend folk. I want you to get our offering out of a fish. Go down to the water, get the first fish you catch, open its mouth, use the pin number, one, two, one, four, now you know my pin number, and pull out some money <laughs> to pay the temple tax. Now, see, Jesus is cool because he says, you're going to try to trap me and make me look like I'm not the son of God. I'm going to get money in a way that only the son of God could get money. Come on now. Because, see, this is the beautiful part about it. Jesus has a way of repurposing our mistakes. Amen? Even when we fail him and we run ahead, God has a way of just making something good out of our mess. This is why the book of Romans says that all things work for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. God knows how to repurpose our mess. And he does it in a way that's not offensive. I love Jesus. And so what's fail-safe number two? Fail-safe number two is don't run ahead of the leader. Don't run ahead of the leader. Wait. Justin, you're sharing up here before the song talking about some of the struggles that you have. We wait. We wait till we hear the voice of God. We wait until he tells us to move. We do not Run ahead. If we run ahead of the leader, we will lose our direction. And then before you know it, we start speaking our own words. Before you know it, we're starting to say stuff that makes no sense. So fail safe number one is listen. Fail safe number two is don't run ahead of the leader. So now we go back to our, our first text, our very first text as we started off this message. In Luke 22, verse 31 and 34, this is in the upper room. Jesus has just shared so many lessons from heaven, and now he's preparing the disciples for what's about to happen. He's telling them a third time, I am going to suffer. Many bad things are going to happen tonight. You guys are going to be scattered. You're, gonna, you're, 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 you're not going to want to stick by me. But Simon, Simon... Satan has asked to sift all of you, not just Simon, but all of you as wheat. Satan has come up to me and asked if he could take you out. He wanted to take you through a Job experience. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. That your faith may not fail. And you know what happens with Peter. He starts to brag. Even if all these other jokers leave you, I will not forsake you. If anyone tries to take you, Jesus, I will fight to the death. Even if I'm taken to prison, I, I will literally take up my cross and I will follow after you. Did, did, did Simon Peter believe that, that he would do this? If push came to shove, Simon Peter believed that he would do this. One of the things that we constantly get tripped up on as followers of Jesus is that we don't know ourselves as well as Jesus knows us. So we make a lot of boastful claims. Oh, I'm telling you, if, if I were one of those disciples back in the day, I would have had his back. If, if I were Adam and Eve, I would have never taken the fruit. If I were David, I would have been happy with just one wife. Always thinking more highly of ourselves, we just don't know who we are. And this is why it's so important as followers of Jesus that we do not, we do not rely on our own personal assessment of ourselves. I had someone close to me the other day tell me, oh, oh, seven years ago, I was so, oh, I'm so glad that I'm where I am today. And I didn't say anything because, you know, I'm a very positive person. But inside, I was like, uh, you the same. <laughs> I don't know who told you you were different, <laughs> but you the same. You're making some of the same decisions, making the same mistakes. 
tripping up on the same stuff. I mean, maybe it's pink instead of green like seven years ago, but you're still making some of the same mistakes. Who told you you were good? Don't worry. I'm not being judgmental. I'm being honest. And I've been there too. Lord, I'm telling you, boy, at this age, Lord, woo, you really... You really brought me a, a long way, a mighty long way. Look at where I am today. And sometimes Jesus look at me like, boy, you don't even know. You're still a hot mess. We do not rely on our own assessment. Because even when we think we have it, all it takes is a moment. All it takes is a lonely night. All it takes is, is, is being hungry. All it takes is not having enough money. All it takes is, is having urges. All it takes is biology taking over. All it takes is a weak moment. And you will start tumbling just like Simon Peter. And just as Jesus said would happen, Simon Peter, he failed. He failed. But there's a fail safe that Jesus has. Because we all get to this point where we deny Christ. We, always get, we all get to this point where we, we don't know ourselves. We all get to the point where we think we're better than we actually are, that we're closer than we actually are to Christ. We all get to this place. But Jesus, Jesus has a built-in a, a, a built fail-safe here. And I want, you to, I want you to read this again here. He says, he says, I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you. Come on, somebody say amen. Jesus prays for us. Come on, somebody say amen. Jesus prays for us he's up there praying for you and for me fail safe number three Jesus prays for you he's like I got you <laughs> I got listen man the devil's strategizing right now he wants to take you out but I'm praying He's not just the God who's listening to prayers. He's the God who's praying for us. That's my intercessor. That's my mediator. I'm praying for you. Fail safe, safe number three, Jesus is praying for us. And there's something that is embedded in this. Not only does he pray for us, but Jesus prophesies. He says, when you return, when you come back, Oh, wait a second, Jesus, why would you even tell Peter? You know what he's about to do. You know how badly he's going to just fall flat on his face. You know how he's been revving up to this passion week with all kinds of mistakes and failures. He's the last person you want to pray next to you in the Garden of Gethsemane. Cut him loose. Cut your losses. He's a Judas when you return. Now, why would Jesus say this? Can I go back to the prophet Yoda? I'm going to go from one of my favorite movies in the trilogy, The Empire Strikes Back, to one of my least favorite, The Last Jedi. An old Luke is now talking to a Yoda. And he's upset because Luke has made so many failures and one of his, his prized pupils became uh, connected to the dark side and so Luke wants to give up. He wants to cut himself off from people and cut himself off from the force. Don't worry, this will make sense. Just chill. And so Yoda tells him, he says, I, you forgot what I told you. Pass on what you have learned. I told you this, pass on what you have learned. He says strength, mastery. Yes, but also weakness, folly, failure also. Yes, failure most of all. The greatest teacher failure is. The greatest teacher, <laughs> failure is. 
the greatest teacher failure is. This is like mind blown. And listen, this is scriptural. This is why we have everybody's failure in scripture. This is why we see David's failure and Samson's failure and Moses' failure because failures teach us. Some of us learn the easy way, but many of us learn the hard way. And Jesus is even telling Peter, I know you're going to return because you're going to learn from your mistakes. Failures can be instructive. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says that Jesus is not only the author of our faith, but the finisher of our faith. I don't want your faith to fail you, and it's not going to fail you, Peter, because I'm the one that has birthed this faith in you. I have authored it, and I'm going to make sure I finish it. Paul says it even better in Philippians 1, 6, and I like the, 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 the New Living Translation. I love the way it's penned here. It says in uh, Philippians 1, 6, and I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Somebody say amen on that one. The good work that God has begun in us, he will continue his work within us until it is complete on the day Christ Jesus returns. Everything that you've experienced in your life, the good and the bad, God is using as ingredients to perfect you. Everything. Nothing goes to waste. Oh, but pastor, if you knew what I did last night. No, 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 no. Nothing goes to waste. All learning opportunities, all learning situations, all learning experiences. God is like, I got you. Even this will work out for the good of those who love the Lord because I love you too and I'm praying for you. So whatever the devil meant for good, we're going to do something. Bad, I mean, what the devil meant for bad, we're going to make something good out of it. This is what happened in the life of Job. Satan wanted to discourage Job, and he accomplished that. He wanted to break his faith. He almost accomplished that. But after it was all said and done, after all of the stress, all the turmoil, all the pain, all the loss of life, Job finally says in chapter 42, all I know is that I used to know you. I thought I knew you. I heard about you. But now, Jesus, I've seen you with my own eyes. And I repent in dust and ashes. After all that pain, all that heartache, all Job could say, I heard about you. My mama used to talk about you. I went to Sabbath school and learned about you. But now after this experience, all the pain, all the failure, all the heartache, all of it, I see you. I see you, right? I see you. And this is what Simon Peter needed to understand. And can I end on this? Can I end on this? The Bible tells us that when Peter had denied Jesus and the, and the rooster crowed, he, he, the rooster crowed, it said that Peter looked to Jesus and Jesus looked to Peter. In the middle of his trial, in the middle of people slapping him and pulling out his beard, in the middle of people spitting in his face, Jesus stopped, turned, and looked at Peter. And his gaze simply said this, I see you, man. I see you. I see you. Keep looking at me. I see you. I see you. Keep looking. Remember when you were walking on water? Remember when you were just a little baby walking on water and you couldn't see me? But I could see you, Simon Peter. And they hit Jesus in the face again. And he raced up just to look. No, no, I'm, I see you. I see you. You're my boy still. Simon Peter began to back away. No, 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 no. Keep looking. And they hit him again. And Jesus raised up. His eyes starting to swell up and, sh and shut. And he could still, I see you. I see you. I see you. Return. I know you're going to run right now, but come back. I love you, man. Come back. Come back. I love you. You're my daughter. You're my son. Come back. I'm not giving up on you. I'm not giving up on you. Come back. And they hit Jesus again in the stomach. And he raised up again. I 
love you, Simon Peter. I love you. If you only knew how much. Jesus sees you. And he's not going to take his eyes off you. No matter how heavy the cross is, no matter how difficult the pain is, Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. And the Bible says in that same verse, Hebrews 12, 2, it says he, he is the author and the finisher of our faith. Before the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. What was the joy that was set before Jesus? You. He was looking at you, Peter. He was looking at you, you. He saw me. Yeah, I see you, John. I see you. I see you. You're my joy. Return. Father God, thank you so much. The challenge that you've given us, you've given us some fail-safes. We wanna be better listeners. We don't wanna run ahead of you. We wanna, we wanna be behind you, following you. And we wanna rest assured that the most important fail-safe is that you are praying for us, that you see us, and that you can repurpose all of our mistakes and make it good for your glory, for our good. So our eyes are opening up and we're seeing you now, Jesus. You were looking at us, but we're now looking at you. And we're not gonna run ahead. And we're not just gonna talk because it sounds sophisticated and more spiritual. We're just gonna listen to you. Be good listeners. Tell us where to go. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for calling us to follow you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.